our rights. God gives us our natural rights and our natural law. God gives us that covenant with him. We elect to render to government a small portion of power to bring what to us? Security. Security. What else? Freedom. Order. Freedom. Yes, we can exercise our freedom as long as I don't push my hand further than his nose. I not that I can Thank you. <laughs> Constructed the Articles of Confederation, what they did 
looking at the Iroquois, and they said, well, how are we going to make this work? Well, we'll leave the militias in the states alone. The, the central government won't have any authority to call a military army together. It'll have to rely on the states to provide that. The states will have the power to have all of their own tariffs. The states will have a lot of separate power, in short. Now, what, what do you think happened as a result? Okay. Articles of Confederation, 1778 or whatever. What happened? They had 10 years. They didn't have chaos, but they had close to chaos. Big states trampled on the rights of the small states. The militias were at the borders, and they raised tariffs. They wouldn't let them pass. The big states had the money for ships. Some of the small states didn't have a navy, obviously. There was an inequity of power. Such an inequity of power that there became a disillusion of the dream of the United States. I should go back to my notes now. <laughs> I think I've skipped them a lot here. <laughs> but what happened? Our forefathers learned from these Iroquois and how to forge a confederation. I said that. Now, who were the people that did that? The Second Continental Congress, they wanted to separate from the British Empire. But before they did that, they had to have a declaration of independence. And I had, to, I had to bring this up because it was important to understand why would this group of warriors of our forefathers, we are now warriors of our forefathers, but why would these forefathers of ours have to, first of all, have a common declaration of independence? Why was it important? What was the declaration about? It was to declare to the English, they gave them kind of a single finger salute in their own way, because they were going to lose what if they got in the way of the British? Their head. <laughs> very, no, very good. And they did that for the Declaration of Independence in 1776 with the words at the end, and for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge what? Our to lives. each other. Our lives. Our lives. Our lives. Our fortunes and our sacred honor. <laughs> In short, they're like the pig at breakfast, not the chicken. <laughs> the pig at breakfast is all in. <laughs> the chicken at breakfast can peck around and lay another egg. He's a confederation. But when we're talking about a declaration of independence with the British, which has the mightiest navy in the world, which has unlimited, unlimited troops, and can pretty much circle any city it wants to, that's kind of a big deal. So let's analyze what, when the Declaration of Independence was done. What made it special? Well, let's see. <clears throat> when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another. That means when we have a society and it becomes necessary because we both believe in God, we both believe that our power and our rights come from God, not from man, not from state. But when it becomes necessary for me to tell you, the British, you know, it ain't working at all. You've taken our tariffs, you've taken our taxation, you are mistreating our children, you are mistreating our lands, you're, you're, you are not, in fact, any longer a good steward of our rights. And we gave, as far as we're concerned, from our perspective, we gave them to you. And now we're taking them back. And to assume among the powers of the earth to separate an equal station in which the laws of nature and the nature's God. Do you understand? Our forefathers referred to natural law and nature's God. Do you understand? There is, when somebody says, why is this important? It's important because it is the nature of man. When we talk, we're talking about the nature of what we are. <coughs> Respect for the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which they were textualists, but they also had values and principles that were not subject to equivocation. We hold these truths to be self-evident. 
That means we all know what they are. That all men are what? <laughs> when they're using the term man, are they referring to just males? No. They're using it within the Greek context of a human being. Any human being are created equal. That they are endowed by who? The With certain unalienable rights. Among these are? That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. Women, children, they're essentially. When a child is in your society, he is accepting the rules and conditions in the, in the law. And that's your duty as a parent to tell that child that. The child has a responsibility to understand that the law is equal for all and that when some police officer suggests they stop doing what they're doing, they don't pull a gun and shoot them or ignore them. My dad had always one philosophy. You're smart enough to get in jail, you should be smart enough to get out. We never tested the philosophy, but I have no, I have no doubt that it would have been that. That to secure these rights, governments are instrumental in deriving the just powers from the consent of the government. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, is instantly destructive to these ends? Yes. <laughs> it is the right of the people to alter. How do we alter? Oh. oh. God, I hadn't thought of that. You're right. So we have a method to alter that. And that's called voting. In this election and in the next election and the next one. It also means you don't just vote for the top one on the ballot. You vote the down ballot. You guys will either vote the down ballot, suffer the consequence. Because Trump needs more people back in the state house and in the Senate and in our, in, in our federal government. And if it doesn't happen, he is powerless to effectuate the changes and alter the things you wish to have altered. It is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government. And let's pray that in 2020, November 3rd, we do just that. And organizing its powers in such a form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and their happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. I mean it. Light and transient causes. I mean causes that aren't legitimate. They're not truly, they're not truly sufficient to bear the action that we're taking. Now, the Declaration of Independence that we've just talked about, this is very important. The Declaration of Independence was what gave rise to the Articles of Confederation. And the Articles of Confederation was what, Mr. McKinney? That's right. Our first, our first Constitution. No, of course. Yes, it, was. it was our first Constitution, the Articles of Confederation. When somebody says the Constitution, I'll say which one. The Articles of Confederation was our first attempt. And for nine years, we tried to get around it. And what happened? Bullies are going to be bullies. There is a reason we have a strong electoral college. Ladies and gentlemen, we have an electoral college for one reason. To keep bullies like Goggins from beating up Mark. <laughs> it is to prevent people like doofus here <laughs> from, from <laughs> it is to prevent people like doofus from printing their own money for no reason, from using his militia without cost. The point is the Constitution would have to come later. The Articles of Confederation was an attempt to embody that Declaration of Independence. Without the Declaration of Independence, no Articles of Confederation would have ever been made. Without the Articles of Confederation, the Constitution would not have been made. Without the Constitution, you wouldn't have a leg to stand on right now. We've been enough people like you. Governor, yes, right now, yes. Okay, so what, where's this going? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> you're probably wondering why would I waste all this time on this miscellaneous garbage. 
Because in 1781, when the Articles of Confederation uh, were passed, and about six years after the Declaration of Independence, what happened is that they had already made the, sep the, the decision separate. And they did not anticipate that the Articles would be that weak. And when they reconvened, they had a, a constitutional convention. We, like Lauren Culp, are not willing to forget, marginalize, compromise, nor reject our past. All of us in this room understand the importance of our past. We recognize our future, for our grandkids and loved ones stand upon the planks of our Constitution and Bill of Rights. Without the Constitution and Bill of Rights, we don't have a future. We, like Jennifer Sefsi, can represent Van Werben, Doug Erickson, Matt Larkin, Jeff Beeler, can have, have all pledged each other and to God our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor, especially when we run for office. Because we're committing time we don't have. We're committing time, money, energy, and we're placing our families in jeopardy. But this is not the end of the story. The Confederation, while it was not perfect, lasted for a few years, 10 years. It failed because the big colonies did bully the small colonies on tariffs and their weapons and, and military might and so forth. And they would not protect the fledgling nation. Essentially, what the, what the big colonies, Virginia and those other states did, New York, you know what they did? They told the, the central government to go fry ice. <laughs> they, they did. Well, I mean, cause, because they set it up in the Articles of Confederation that the only military the, the, the central government could have would be coming from the states. So the states said, well, if we don't believe in your cause, the heck with you. We're not going to, we're not going to. And put a tariff on ourselves. We're not going to use our military to slow us down. No. So our founding fathers had the decision. They had to try and convince Goggins and Doofus here. <laughs> they had to convince them to reconvene another constitutional convention. They had to think it over. Hey, what are we going to do about this problem? We've got big states bullying small, uh, big colonies bullying small colonies. What are we going to do? Well, what happened is that they realized that they had a choice. They could either put it together or allow the British monarchical powers, the German powers, all of the French powers, all of those nations were far stronger than the United States was. So what essentially became an essence of this conflict is the Federalists, the Federalists were Washington and Hamilton. They were the ones on the East Coast. The Federalists of the East Coast, Washington and Hamilton, were very dedicated to keeping a strong federal government. Strong federal government. Some getting funded all the table. Now, the consequence of them, the consequence of them on the East Coast colonies, that was in the Northeast Coast, they had a bunch of agrarian colonies as well. Those agrarian colonies, agricultural colonies, wanted not to be outvoted and outgunned all of them. So they had a different agrarian outlook towards government than did the East Coast elites. Hamilton was kind of an elite, and so was Washington, whether you like it or not. But Washington got all his money from Martha anyway, so I was Washington. <laughs> but I mean, essentially, they had, a, they had a very large plantation. But Washington wasn't really interested in governance per, per se. He did not like being president, and he certainly wouldn't become monarch because he didn't like that. Either. He would like that even less. So thank God, neither Washington nor, and thank God, Hamilton never assumed the presidency because he had never. Been. So here we are. We have fledgling nation. We have a failed government system, a government a government system that did not work. After George Washington's term was ended in 1800. Jefferson took over. Now, unlike Washington, Jefferson was a true scientist, agronomist, 
a brilliant, brilliant man uh, in, of agriculture. And Jefferson was a different type of individual. The, the people that supported Jefferson, the people that supported Jefferson are much like the people in this room. And I doubt that you've ever heard this, uh, but I want to read you the last stanza of a poem about Jefferson and liberty. The last stanza of this poem says, From Europe's wants and woes remote, a friendly waste of waves between, here plenty cheers the humblest cock and smiles on every village green. Let foes to freedom dread the name, but should they touch the sacred tree, twice 50,000 swords would flame for Jefferson and liberty. Jefferson looked at the tree of liberty as the sounding symbol, and his followers looked at it as the symbol of American freedom, United States freedom. He wanted to preserve that tree of freedom. His life was dedicated to it. Thomas Jefferson, the redhead, devoted his life to writing and thinking, and he did a marvelous job of both. And in Thomas Jefferson's first inaugural address, Thomas Jefferson stated to one and all, unlike most of our politicians today, I will compress my principles into the north, north, narrowest compass. They will bear stating the general principle, but not all its limitations. Now listen to these, and then tell me which ones are similar to Trump's today. Trump is not painting outside the box. He is painting the box as it ought to be painted. Trump is the first president, and I include Reagan, and I was Reagan's campaign chair for two terms. I was also Trump's first campaign chair at Rockland County and Skagit County. In 2015, I accepted it. In 2015, I did support Trump. I'm very proud of that. Here's what Jefferson said we ought to stand for when we forge, when we forge the new Constitution, because he helped write it. And he helped write his first inaugural speech, too. Here's what he said. He expects equal and exact justice to all men, of whatever state or persuasion, religious or political, peace, commerce, and honest friendship with all nations, Entangling alliances with none. Hmm, does that sound like Trump? Does he want entangling alliances overseas with every, every, every country? I don't think so. The support of the state governments in all their rights as the most competent administrations for our domestic concerns and the surest bulwarks against anti-Republican tendencies. The states are our bulwark against anti-Republican tendencies. How has that worked out so far for Trump? Pretty good, except in which states? Democratic states tend not to listen too well. Nor do they agree. All right. The preservation of the general government and its whole constitutional vigor as a sheet anchor of our peace at home and safety abroad. A jealous care of the right of election by the people. A mild and safe corrective of abuses which are locked by a sword of revolution for peaceable remedies are unprovided. Absolute acquiescence in the decisions of the majority. Does Trump go along with the decision of the majority? Where, yes, he does. Where has he ever violated the decision of the majority in the Senate or the House or anything else? Where has he gone against the House of Representatives? Against it. He hasn't called it. He hasn't done anything. He hasn't used, used, abused his power. He hasn't done any of that. He's scared them a lot, but that's their problem. <laughs> a well-disciplined militia. Our best reliance in peace and for the first moments of war. Isn't that what he says? We have the weapons, I don't want to use them. That's what Trump is saying now. Nothing has changed since 1800. It's 200 years. In 200 years, Jefferson's speech, inaugural speech, 
hasn't changed a bit. The honest payment of our debts and sacred preservation of the public faith. Encouragement of agriculture and of commerce as it's handling. Now, the only thing he didn't put in there was tech industry and AI, because I agree with all of you, if we don't get on top of AI, the Chinese are going to bury us. Freedom of religion, freedom of the press, freedom of person under the protection of habeas corpus, and trials by jurors impartially selected. The wisdom of our sages and blood of our heroes have been devoted to their attainment. They should be creed of our political faith, the text of civil instruction, the touchstone by which to try the services of those we trust. And should we wander from them in moments of error or alarm, let us hasten to retrace our steps to regain the road which alone leads to peace, liberty, and safety. Jefferson's first inaugural speech. He's asking the people to retrace their steps. I'm asking you to retrace yours. I'm asking all of you to begin thinking clearly and devoutly about what it is you wish to leave your kids. Jefferson was with, with, differed with Washington very much in 1800 in this speech. The year, this is, as far as I'm concerned, 1800 is when we crystallized the war between the Eastern elites and the flyover country. Now, I know that maybe you guys can't make that jump, but I, I think intellectually it's an honest jump. That Hamilton and Washington certainly weren't like Inslee, okay? I agree. But imagine Inslee being what he is. There's nothing we can do about that as a Democratic governor, except vote him out of office. That's the only thing we can do. But my point is Washington and Hamilton had the same tendencies. Washington and Hamilton believed that the federal government should be the centralization of power and that the minions, the agriculture people, just weren't that important. And that's an attitude Jefferson didn't share with Hamilton and Washington, which is why he ran against them and won. Now, Jefferson believed in crystallizing his conflict of red state versus blue state Man must be free to regulate his own pursuits, free to allow those powers he deemed prudent and always recognizing the first fundamental belief. All state power comes from the people who are endowed by God with that power. This is our conflict today, 220 years later. Today, 200 years later, politicians who are were, who were virtuous would pronounce their love of a more centralized government. The, the fact is we don't have honest governors that when they're Democrats and they take power, they're getting their shots called from the Democratic leadership. They don't have the courage to do what's in the best interest of their citizens, even though they may disagree with the Jeffersonians, which I consider myself, but they don't have the courage to say, the Democratic House of Representatives in our current situation has gone way out of bounds. But most of the blue states are not governed by virtuous federalists. Remember what a federalist is? Washington and Hamilton. Leaves them stronger central government. They're not virtuous federalists like Washington or Hamilton at all. They are governed by self-absorbed, ignorant, arrogant individuals who neither love this nation, its unique constitution, they don't love its brilliant forefathers and our insightful forefathers. The problem is that brilliant writers such as Jefferson pointed this out, that there was going to be conflict, and he knew that. The Democratic governors clamor for chaos. Democratic governors such as Inslee clamor for chaos like some undiapered five-year-old screaming from room to room, knowing not why they run. They are led by communists such as Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who still refuses to learn enough history or political science that, she, that, that for her to realize that she is an economic fascist. Economic fascist meaning she understands that states should control all means of central production and only that private industry is allowed which enhances the state. 
wishing to be armed by a state with the Nazi power she covets to inflict her totalitarian principle. Let's call it as it is. She admits she's a communist. Their manifesto, the Greek, is communist. There is, there's no question that she admits that. That any U.S. citizen admires this affront to freedom and it astonishes me and should appall you. We are warriors of our forefathers and we will prevail in this election because we must for our children, our grandchildren, and for the next 200 years. We must prevail so that your children and your grandchildren may continue this great nation as they become warriors for our forefathers. We must prevail in this election because reverting to a state of nature and a state of chaos as our socialist enemies would desire is not an option that we have available to us. We must prevail because our children, their children in the next 200 years depends on us.